I am Jeffrey Kluger, author of Apollo 8 and editor-at-large at Time Magazine. I'm John Sterling, the editor of Apollo 8. When the three astronauts flew around the far side of the moon and lost radio contact with Earth, they were alone in a way no humans ever had been. Uh, the cockpit conversations they had on the back side of the moon only recently became available. And what would you say those conversations revealed about these three men and, and how did they respond to this incredible experience? I think they responded in a way that they didn't anticipate responding. They are, and they're all still alive, so I don't even have to use the past tense, they are all very pragmatic men. They are all engineers. They are all men who are business first. But they are not immune to human wonder. That doesn't mean it comes out of them easily. A lot of them will just say, well, it's a mission, and that's all I care to talk about. But when you hear their confidential conversations on those cockpit re recorders, no air to ground, it's just them talking to one another, they are exclaiming at the beauty of what they're seeing. They're exclaiming at the improbability of what they're seeing. Bill Anders, the rookie, was the mission photographer and the mission topographer, so he knew the surface of the moon better than anyone else, and he knew the technical names for the surface, for the features on the moon better than anyone else. And yet even Bill Anders, looking out the window, trying to decipher the way the light was washing out some of the features, said, uh, I can't tell the <laughs> holes from the bumps. He was looking for the words craters and rills, but they had eluded him at that moment because his engineer's mind, his geologist's mind, had just exploded at what he was seeing. As we say in the book, when Frank Borman first saw the earth hanging in the sky, his words were, gee, that's pretty. His thoughts were, this must be what God sees. So if you have these guys who are trained in engineering and then they can get out to this world and just become suffused with poetry or what passes for poetry when you're dealing with engineers, that tells you something about the primal way they were touched by this. They knew they had a mission, but they knew that mission was equal parts spiritual and lyrical. And you, I don't necessarily mean, necessarily mean theocratically, theologically uh, spiritual. It was just that primal human spirituality. And I think they experienced it that way.